Thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, so I just want to make a comment on the expertise of our speakers in infrastructure and, uh, and super blocks. Efficiency is very important. You may not know this, but we have a clock right here in front of us. Each speaker has 10 minutes. So we're on time and under budget, which is the best thing for any expert. So thank you all for uh, following your mandate very clearly. And let me maybe kick off the discussion. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Kevin, because I know you've had experience in rail transport, and I think everyone mentioned connectivity in one way or another, and that's one of the real challenges here. Maybe you could give us your observations on where we are in terms of rail development in Jakarta uh, at this point. Okay. Um, I had my first meeting on the uh, Jakarta MRT in, I think it was August 1995, was the first time I met, so that's 21 years ago. So it's, it's taken a while to get it, to get it moving. Um, but it's encouraging. I think that um, we can see it's being built. The, we're doing some stations down in Labuk Bulus and down Fatmawati. Um, it would have been better if it had been sooner, but we can't do anything about that. But it's pivotal in terms of making Jakarta um, a livable city, which is what we need to do. We've got to get people out of their cars. Um, initiatives that are going on in Singapore, car light. We've got to get people onto public transport. And we've got to join all of these systems up. Um, one of the key things that is happening around um, the architectural world, lots of conferences on TOD, Transport Orientated Development. So people recognise that if you build railways and stations, that's the best place to put your development. That's the best place to put your super block. It's nothing new. People were doing that 100 years ago in the UK and in Europe and, and to a lesser extent in the US. So moving forward here in Jakarta, it's, it's got to be a government kind of initiative to really push forward the, the uh, infrastructure, light rail, airport link, high-speed rail, MRT, but it's all got to be linked up. If they're all done independently, then that's not going to work. Thank you very much, Kevin. Anyone else like to comment on connectivity? Or shall I open it up to the floor? Open it up to the floor. Uh, please, uh, if you have a question, just to raise your hand, uh, give your name and affiliation. And if you'd like to direct it to a specific uh, panelist, uh, please uh, do so. So now open uh, for questions. Thank you. Um, my name is Irfan. I'm from 99.co. Um, I have uh, three questions. Um, I think I'm addressing these questions to uh, Kevin or Craig, uh, feel free. Uh, maybe one of you can, can answer. Um, number one is, what is the ideal land size for a project to be called uh, a super block? The, the ideal land size, the minimum land size. And number two, um, what is the minimum uh, building ratio uh, or KDP uh, for a super block? And number three, what is the minimum requirements so that we can call a project as a super block? So that's three questions for me. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll attempt to answer the, all three questions. In terms of minimum size, I mean, you know, I don't think there is a pure definition. If you want to get a dictionary definition or look at Wikipedia and find out what the definition is, I think broadly speaking in terms of size, um, you're going to be looking at at least around four or five hectares. Um, that's, that's my opinion. I think anything smaller than that really can't be regarded as a super block. And bear in mind also what we've touched on in our introductory remarks. I mean, there's lots of different examples of what a super block could look like. Um, we've mentioned, you know, master planned townships like BSD could be a super block. Something like uh, Sudirman CBD, you know, would qualify as an example of a super block, or even Central Sinai and the Kojima development. Um, you know, that was. Uh, you know, the planning for that began in the 1980s, and now that's around 18 hectares with a mall, um, three office towers, four residential towers, a recently opened Fairmont Hotel. So all, broadly speaking, all of these um, you know, qualify as super blocks, but I think you have to get a, a threshold size of around four to five hectares, I think, uh, to, to qualify. Also, you look at, uh, you know, overseas examples. Certain universities follow a super block concept. I mean, they're, in, they're educational facilities, but they have other residential components, retail components, master planned, um, campuses for multinational companies. 
Um, maybe you haven't visited them, but you might be familiar with what Google have or Apple have or IBM have in, in North America. Very large campus style integrated and planned communities where certainly connectivity exists, but they also provide uh, very much uh, an environment for innovation. Um, in terms of KDB and Ka'el Bay, again, you know, super blocks don't necessarily have to be high rise. I think we all agree that, uh, you know, in our urban centres we have to go more vertical than horizontal, but I don't think there's a strict requirement for them to be high rise, high density. It depends on, again, what you regard as the concept of, of a super block. But um, I think the, the important thing is that uh, different components have uh, equal priority, and I'm talking about social components, cultural components, economic components, etc. within the super block. I think it has to be more than just a place for business. Uh, I think that sometimes lip service is paid to, um, you know, what people regard as an, an ideal environment. I sometimes have a, a bit of a laugh to myself when I see brochures of projects, the way they're described, um, and I look at the brochure and you know, you think it's going to be Nirvana, the way some developers describe their projects, but the finished product often leaves a lot to be desired. Even within some so-called super blocks, the connectivity is not there. They're not pedestrian friendly. If you're, if you're within a super block, at the very least within that super block, you need to be able to move around efficiently. Um, so sometimes the, the planning aspect is ignored. So again, that comes back to something I touched on earlier. Having the vision, I mean, I think we would all agree, what is the vision for Jakarta? What do we want it to look like in 30 or 40 years' time? Uh, there's a lot that can be learned from overseas. I think we can draw a lot of knowledge from cities like Barcelona, uh, cities like Seoul in South Korea, the concept of smart cities. And yes, it's not all going to be achievable instantly in Indonesia, but what are the things that we can bring? What can we learn from overseas experiences and bring to Indonesia uh, you know, within the next few years um, so that we can start to adapt some of this, this knowledge uh, for, the, for the betterment of the local environment. I think I covered two parts to your question, maybe not the last part. Yeah, well, I touched on that at the beginning. The minimum requirement, I think, is going to be at least around four or five hectares, but ideally it's going to be bigger than that. Components? Again, look, that's a matter of an opinion. I think, you know, uh, broadly speaking, uh, you know, residential and business space um, and, and retail space, pr probably most people would say they're the core requirements. Somewhere to live, somewhere to, uh, to work and somewhere to play. Uh, recreational food and beverage, places for people to meet. Um, you know, meeting spaces these days are at a premium, and I think a, a lot of us, you know, we tend to meet in coffee shops and hotels and try to be efficient in Jakarta because, um, you know, getting around is so difficult. If, if you know, I, I work in the Sinayan area, if I'm going to have meetings up in the sort of the North Sedim or Tamarin area, well, I'll try and plan my meetings so that I don't have to move around too much. I think most people do that. Now, the MRT, when that's finished, it's going to be very interesting to see what difference it makes to productivity in this city. If people can get on the MRT in or around the Sidim and CBD area and be up in you know, the Plaza Indonesia area within seven or eight minutes and be able to return quickly, that can have an enormous benefit to productivity. Uh, more meetings, uh, you know, instead of having two or three meetings in a day, if we could have six or seven meetings in a day, it's gonna make this city much more productive. I would only add that I think that a, a, a successful super block has a kind of varied and rich kind of layering of different um, components, not just kind of high-end residential that's probably empty most of the time, not just high-end retail and not just office buildings. I think a truly successful super block has civic, cultural uh, spaces within it and it is something that is vibrant and, and is lived in. And um, that's something that is, is quite, a, quite a challenge in how to make that financially viable. But otherwise, we are going to end up with a lot of these places that are half empty most of the time.